Hello and welcome to the Atomic Salt Live Show. This is the show where we're going to discuss everything in the tabletop hobby world. I am Wild Chevy, and as always, I'm joined by Casey. Casey, how are you this week? I'm doing great this evening. Alan, yourself? I'm doing pretty good. Let's kick it off by discussing what we've done this week in the tabletop hobby world. I'll, I'll let you lead it. Uh, does buying stuff count? Uh, it doesn't feel like I did a whole lot. I've actually started uh, working on my Riptide a little bit. Uh, really? I've had a, I've had a Riptide sit, sitting around in my closet for a long, long time, and now that I finally got a bunch of Infinity stuff out of the way, I figure it's time to start working on those guys. So, so no longer proxying cups. Oh well, not until it's done, you know. So maybe maybe one or two more times. You know, I, I actually I don't like proxying stuff. It it kind of gives me a dirty feeling, but there is a practical side to that. Like you just sometimes you just have to do it to experiment with things. You know, you can't just buy everything that you ever want to try. Yeah, that's what I'm kind of running into a little bit. But it's all you done this week. It's just a uh, buy. What'd you buy? Did that? Uh, I bought my Codex, the new What's Tau it? Codex. Is it, is so. It, so was it a reprint or is it a, a full new Codex? You know, uh, you could definitely say that. Uh, I can see how a small supplement, you know, to the old Codex, you know, will work. And so I feel like GW was trying to uh, do things nice for people and give them the option of, you know, not forcing them to buy a whole new book just for three or four new pages. It's actually more than that. There's a few subtle changes to some things, but uh, it is fairly rules, similar. Right? There are some new rules uh, to units. Uh, there's some new options. You know, it's a little bit more than just the a new storm surge and ghost keel and a few formations, but uh, well, maybe we'll talk about that in a little bit. So you've uh, bro you broke down, spent some money. That's always good. Didn't have to spend anything. This was I actually had a credit at our local games for Gamers Asylum, so got to got to pick this up for free. Nice, dirty deeds. Hey, you know, we all got to do what we all got to do. <laughs> all right, so you uh, defiled the new codex. Anything else? You know, that's it. It's actually been kind of a quiet week for me in hobby. Let's uh, let's see what you're doing there, man. Uh, so me this week, uh, I played some 40K, destroyed, destroyed my list, rebuilt it again. Oh, shoot, we did play 40K, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> Why I don't do this at the very beginning of the week, you know? Yeah, that, that, that was very rough. Doing a, doing a Monday night gaming session made, uh, made for a long week. It did. So, anyways, so how did your game go? We'll talk about mine after. Oh, mine, it, it came down to the la or down to the secondaries, secondaries and tertiaries. It, it was pretty rough. I only had a few guys left in the table, and I'm finding some weaknesses in my current list. I, I just the the mix up. Uh, yeah, uh, Blood Angel, Grey Knights. I'm not. I currently haven't found a good either Alpha Strike, Death Star, something to sustain. So I'm, I'm looking around to fix that issue. How was your game? Well, it. Well, get this right out of the way. I lost, uh, but it was kind of a. It was more of a drag out match. So uh, it was against Tyranids. We had three flyerants, um, 
the other flying creature, the the hive crone, mm-hmm. uh, a bunch of lictors, and three Molochs. So, it it was a real. So he was he was playing a lot of reserve games. He was. Uh, really kind of like neg- negating any of my shots with his, uh, you know, with being able to fly. So uh, we went to round six, you know, we played a full six rounds and by the end of it, he beat me. So uh, had the game gone on a little longer, I would have been able to beat him, I think, you know, because uh, he was finally getting forced to put all of his stuff out. He wasn't able to hide it in reserves. And I was really finally able to start chipping away at all of you know those little things that were playing hide and seek with me. So uh, I did experiment with the new uh, optimized stealth suit cadre. That's one where you take a a ghost kill plus two stealth suit squads. I really really like this unit. I think that it does a great job on the table. So uh, it's tough. It shoots well. It ignores cover. And even in a pinch, you can assault with them, which I did. And they actually do fairly well for themselves. Tau in assault? I know. It seems crazy, right? But uh, the Riptide isn't actually bad at assault. The Ghost Keels aren't actually bad at assault either. So uh, I did end up losing, you know, just because uh, he was able to kind of negate what the strengths of my army were. So... Uh, but I'm kind of recent there, you know, reworking my list, rethinking it, and uh, we'll come back stronger next time. That's always good thinking. <laughs> it's a uh, it's the Tao way of way of life, you know. We uh, when we win, we look and see how we can do better. When we lose, we look and see how we can do better. So I am a Tao at heart. <laughs> So yeah, let's see. I, we did the 40k. Um, we didn't do any RPG this week. We kind of uh, uh, stuff happened. I blame Austin. Yeah. B- blame the redhead. I wouldn't say he's a redhead. He's the ginger of the group. Uh, strawberry blonde, maybe. <laughs> At the most. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we so we didn't touch on to that. So um, I did get some infinity play. Yeah, so you brought your hawk. How'd they do? Uh, it, they went pretty well. It was a it was kind of like a refresher match for me, and I didn't know really what to bring. I uh, I know everybody is hopping on to uh, QK because of. The, their success um, at interplanetary. So I was like, all right, I'll just, I want to bring something fun. I, I, since I was painting these all up, all my uh, gulams, it's like I'm going to bring every gulam I have. Oh, no. Yeah. So I had a list. I had eight orders in the first group, seven in the second group. Um, Guam split in between, and yeah, it was a uh, it was interesting. Okay, now let me ask you this. Now I'm not saying that you shouldn't run as many orders as possible in an army, and I'm not going to tell anybody that there's a right way or a wrong way to play Infinity. But when you st- when we start getting this many order list, and it starts taking so long to play. Do you feel like you're violating the social contract with your opponent? It it it, uh, it makes it. I mean, with the N three, there was a point reduction uh, across the board. Um, and before, like I could make a three hundred point list with ten uh, ten orders easily. Now I have to make. I got like the same list as, um, or the same list. Is now cheaper, so I can add more guys into it. And now I'm having 
two groups. So that's what I'm running into. Is I'm getting uh, the stuff I'm taking is making me do two groups, and yeah, it's kind of interesting having multiple pools and a lot of orders. Right, and and I understand. And the piece of introduction. I just wonder, is it still a skirmish game? Yeah. Or is it, you know, uh, is it fair to your opponent? Because, uh, I mean, are you using up too much of the, too much time in like an ITS game, like in a tournament scene? I mean, even if you're not slow play, even playing at a regular speed, going through 14, 15 orders is, takes a long time. Yeah. And, and that doesn't leave your opponent with much time to do his orders. Yeah, it was a, it was an interesting game. Uh, the guy went against uh, played Jujing. Uh, he had a very uh, very heavy special weapons uh, cost list. He had ten orders, and uh, just yeah with. But he was able to get off a lot of shots with AROs, uh, or get a lot of shots off on me because of my placements. And yeah, it was. I mean, we were. I thought I was going to lose, um, but I pulled the win off because of the objectives. We did. Um, we did it. The the. Mysterious objective one, where you, yeah, the, you flip four and then each person gets one. Um, but yeah, yeah, highly classified, highly classified. Yeah, we uh, we duked it out, and it was pretty much turn two was the deciding factor of the game. But yeah, I thought I was going to lose the game actually because he had his uh, lieutenant uh, lieutenant tag. Just kind of walking across the board, and if it wasn't for him shooting an HMG and pretty much decimating all my troops, he probably would have uh, got a lot more objectives for like uh, coup de gras. Hmm. So I believe that's the the Guija tag, right? No, not the not the new one. Uh, the one that just they did the remodel of. Um, it's the one that's on the front of A to Z. Oh, okay. I can't remember the, the name of it, but I know which one you're talking about. Yeah. Don't know that, the, the Oyori? Oyori, yeah. That is not fun to face. <laughs> yeah, if... Uh, gosh. Okay, so... As much as I... like. I love playing 40k with my buddies, but I have to say that I enjoy playing Infinity more. I, I wish that I could bring our gaming group around to Infinity more completely, you know, so we could play a little bit more. Because in 40k, more and more, it's feeling like I'm just, you know, I'm bashing my list up against the other guy's list, and it's really just a question of, you know, who has designed the better list. Yeah. You know, and it's it's my turn, you know, and I just I beat the crap out of them, and then it's their turn, and they just beat the crap out of me, and it just kind of goes like that for the rest of the game. Whereas I've really come to enjoy the flow of Infinity. Yeah, I, I agree. It's even even like the modified Maelstroms that we play that were less that we're playing bit because it's part of the tournament. Even then it's it's interesting that yeah, 40k it's very cuz like my like I said I have to rebuild my list again to do something else and it's I'm just like I have to it's like okay, how much more money do I have to spend to win? Whereas in Infinity it's like okay, I've got my collection of stuff here. I'm bringing these I'm bringing six gulons here, uh, that uh, just do whatever they they can do. They're they're not the most powerful. Um, they just 
they can do what uh, what little they can, but they made the game fun. Yeah, and you know, money aside, because Infinity is a infinitely cheaper game than 40k. Uh, I feel like there's a lot more strategy that goes into it. Like in 40k, I'm just looking at what can beat the crap out of my opponents the most. Whereas Infinity, I'm looking for all those different tools to put in my toolbox. You know, I have a doctor or a medic. You know, what What am I doing with this? Yeah, if, if 40k had something where you had, you had to have a certain unit that to uh, to get the objective, not just the troop. It'd be more a little bit more interesting because yeah, you'd have to. Okay, so you're not going to take a alpha strike, or you're not going to take um, the the super friends squad and just wreck house. You can be like, okay, I need to take this unit here because I can't win an objective without it. I concur, which is why, yeah, after that game, maybe it was because I lost, but I just remember thinking, I would have had more fun if we played Infinity. You know, I still have, I have a great time with my friends. You know, I still have a lot of fun rolling dice, but I really believe that Infinity is the better game. Well, so. I tend to agree with you there. Just, <laughs> and maybe that's why we keep getting more people coming over to infinity now if we could just convince chad and darren to switch over we had chad convinced but it'll it'll be a while. it will be so it, it won't be until at least after lvo yeah then we'll lose him to magic oh boy he is getting back into it um <laughs> yeah we need to stop that train all right so no fancy transitions. We're just going to go right over to it. Drop Fleet Commander. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Let me pull up the... Let's see. Yes, Drop Fleet Commander released this week. And it's doing pretty well so far in the campaign. Yeah, three hundred forty-four thousand isn't too bad. Yeah, I mean they're kicking butt so far. A little, a little interesting though. Yeah, yeah, you pointed it out earlier that they are, were a little unprepared for stretch goals. Uh, they were acting a little unprepared just in general uh, once they started. Yeah, it's interesting. If you look through the two comments that they had in their first section, you know, the their very first comment that they that they came up was, "Wow, you know, we funded. Thank you all very much. We're so humble. We never knew if we were actually going to fund or not." And here's our first couple set of stretch goals, and it was hilarious because they'd already blown past both of those stretch goals. <laughs> and then their their second one was, "So, yeah, we need to." stop and think about things and we'll get back to everybody yeah and and that, it's interesting yeah i mean i i get i get that it's very it's a very humble kickstarter because they said okay we really just want to make um the stuff in plastic everything is already designed everything's modeled out we just want to make this in in plastic here here's the initial product is the starter box and it's going to have these two armies and then i was like oh we well, want more <laughs> and they had to to rush on that rush to get the information out right yeah like i don't think that they had actually planned all that many stretch goals out you know other than unlocking you know more than just the the two core fleets in the box uh I think that was all they really had planned. Yeah. Oh, and now they've got. Let's see. They've uh, 
They've got PHR. Uh, they've got the Shaltari. So that's four races unlocked. Have they showed up? Have they showed off the PHR stuff yet? Uh, I haven't checked it today. I not yet. Um, they just barely hit the the funding. I haven't seen an update yet. Oh, barely hit the funding. I'm sure that that was like two hundred thousand or something. So, oh, there's three updates. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, um, Beast of War. They're doing their drop fleet weekend, going through what's in uh, how to move and everything. But like the models themselves are just so beautiful. I mean, look at that. Those are some pretty looking ships. Those are easily the best looking ships that I have ever seen in a fleet game. Bar none. Yeah. And then that's and then we have that's the UMC the box our box. There's the scourge. Very, very, I like the style that they're doing in this game. I have to say the one thing that I do not like, as a minor quibble, is, is the ships are so detailed and they have their design so nailed down that a lot of times I have trouble differentiating between one class of ship and the other. Yeah, it is a little goofy. Well, not goofy. Uh... I agree. Like when you see all the ships stacked up. So yeah, PHR starter fleet unlocked. Yeah, all the ships together. It's like, what am I looking at? <laughs> yeah, like right. right there. Like this this screen right here. Now I I realize that what they've done is they've they've tried to make this as similar as possible to unify the design aspect and also to make manufacturing easier. Yeah. But I have a really hard time telling the difference between a Seattle and a new Cairo. And I wonder how much that's gonna translate to on the table. Yeah. I I agree. It's gonna be interesting. Um yeah, it'll be, I guess, one of those quirks to you figure out. But yeah, it should. I mean, they. I'm wondering how easy magnetization will be on these ships. Because if it's the same uh, frame, and then you just put stuff in there to to make one ship. Uh, one cruiser look one way compared to the other. So yeah, the, like the Rio class there versus uh, the Madrid. It looks very similar in the top parts. It, it's just the the lower gun area. I wonder how easy magnetization will be for that. Right. Right. So if if you start looking, there's there's a few common shapes to everything. And it looks like the kind of like the lower part is something that that you can swap out, and maybe like the tail of it as well. But I could see this being kind of like a generic U shape that you just kind of bolt things onto. But then you also got to wonder how much variety are you going to need? Yeah. Will you be taking one of each of these, or will you majority mostly be taking a single type, and then one or two others for spice? I don't know. It's it's interesting. Uh, hopefully they'll, they'll release more. I mean, it's only a few days in, and I'm I'm really chomping to see what more they're gonna um, show for the game. But yeah, I just love the the gosh the paint up that they did on these is just amazing. Yeah, I mean the scourge. Very organic looking. It's going to be hard to, <laughs> to differentiate because they all they're all squiggly squid monsters. Altari looks pretty cool. Yeah, and then yeah, they've got the piece of war. Uh, weekend stuff. So they're they're talking about 
aspects of the game. How are you going to maneuver? How are you going to shoot? And have you watched those videos yet? Yes, I have. What do you think of it? I I like it. The it it's a little bit of a kin. Oh, it's um, very similar to the board game or the the miniature uh, tabletop game. Um, where it's alternate activations, and, and or if anybody else out there is, if you play uh, X, you or you pretty much you you've got cards for all your stuff, and then you shuffle it up and say, and then you put it into order you're gonna do, and then you flip the cards, and whoever has the higher value gets to go first. So you'll move, they'll move. Uh, there's different there's different orbits and that affects how ships play. Uh, there's different orders you can do that generate more uh, heat, I guess, for your ships, making it more visible to the other ships. So it there's a lot of there's a lot of variety on tactics, and it just it just goes from the, the movement phase down to shooting. It, there's uh, there's a lot of depth. So I see it's going to be a very cool game. And then uh, just like uh, drop uh, drop zone commander, it's not about just destroying the other team. It's about the objectives. So that helps out a lot too, I think. Hmm. So, in the future, because it seems like, like I said, this was a very humble Kickstarter, and it's been exploding. What do you think Hawk is going to do to try and fill out the next thirty-one days for their Kickstarter? Well, they've. Um, I think they're. Well, they've said that this is going to be a Kickstarter game. That they are not going to do a lot of ex a lot of super exclusives. That they're going to make the game and have um, store exclusives. So instead of you getting stuff for the game, then you get the whole box and that's it. You don't really need to buy anything else later on. They're gonna have stuff that goes directly to the stores, so you can buy more of the of what you need at your local gaming store. It helps support your local uh, scene. So, with the way that Hawk has been overwhelmed, do you think that they could have done a little more planning, or do you think they could have prepared a little better, or do you think there was no way of knowing that, that how big this was going to blow up? I think well, unless he had, unless they would have had somebody on their staff that has done a Kickstarter before. I mean, this is they're 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 cutting their teeth, <laughs> learning the ins and outs. So definitely, they'll they'll know. I mean, they've um, they've not fallen into the traps like we've seen in other Kickstarters where they're just going to be like, all right, we're gonna. Here's our pre-planned stuff, and we're just going to keep going, going, going. And they've said they've stated a lot that they want an on-time delivery, which is pretty ballsy to say for Kickstarter. Yeah, like I appreciate the mature way in which they are trying to run this campaign, but at the same time, I believe that. They could have been slightly better prepared for that, like that initial wave of funding that comes in, because you know, pretty much you could say a third of the funding happens in the first twenty-four hours, and then a third of the funding happens in the last twenty-four hours, and everything else happens in between. Uh, and so it seems like it caught them just a little bit flat-footed. Now, granted, this is blown up huge for these guys, but. I, I wonder if maybe they weren't quite prepared as maybe they should have been. Yeah, that seems to be the case, but 
I mean, they're handling it very maturely. They're not, they're letting it go in stride. They're not trying to please the backers to get more money. They're saying, okay, you guys have shown us that you love our game. We like that. And we're going to be working to try to make it as the best game we can for you guys. Which I appreciate. It means that they've got a, a clear vision of what they want this to be versus let's just see how much money we can throw at this and, and get it as big as possible. So have, have you... Have you weighed in on this? Are you uh, are you a backer? Yes, I am a backer. I'm at the what level am I at? Ah. I'm at the commander level right now, and I say right now because I've got other friends that are interested in the game. I'm at the commander level, which is. It's a two, the two-player part of the set, so it has all the the, um, the two fleets, terrain, and accessories. And if I can get somebody else to uh, break in with me, because I want PHR, but I, I can I'll I'll more than likely uh, get the bolt on to get the PHR starter, but. That, that little bit of me that likes the exclusives thing, the captain level has two starter sets. So you can split split it with somebody else. One person uh, gets uh, the Scourge, the other one gets the UMC. You've got two, uh, two full fleets of stuff. And also comes with the exclusive battle cruiser. Yeah, I got to admit, I love the way that UCM stuff looks. And that exclusive battle cruiser is pretty slick. So, yeah, it, it, that's my current <laughs> current situation on spending money. It's what how much how much can I get other people to help me? <laughs> yeah, you need a you need a couple more people to kind of kick in on that. So what you want to do is you want to find someone who wants UCM, someone who wants Scourge, and then you can bolt on your PHR to that yeah. and then just split that up three ways. So, so I, I really like the, the, the terrain maps. It's different. It's really yeah. different. Yeah, because it's, it's not a in space. It's in orbit. So the game... Uh, yeah, that's that's your play area. Is over the continent. I see. I'm not sure how I feel about that because realistically, I know that space combat would take place around planets. You know, not just like fleets out in the middle of between the stars. That doesn't make any sense. But at the same time, I'm just wondering: does it still feel like a fleet game? So I don't know. I need to watch the Beast of War videos. Well, I mean, Find out more about it. You figure you're you're transitioning in system. You're you're trying to take out or trying to pick up intelligence. So you're going to send in your your. It's ba they basically said this is a game. Um, where it's it's drop drop zone, but it's ha it's drop zone. What's happening above drop zone? So drop zone is uh, you're you're bringing in the troops, taking over the objective and whatnot. Drop fleet, it's okay. We are we have to get you on the ground. ODSTs go. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're interested in a book that that looks and feels very similar to this, I recommend it's a, a series called The Lost Fleet by Jack Campbell. Excellent, excellent series of books. He's actually a formal naval officer. And uh, the, the books, it's kind of like Battlestar Galactica a little bit, in which you have a fleet that's, you know, 
stuck behind enemy lines is trying to make its way home or, or find its way home. Uh, but it's really, really cool the way he goes into like the fleet combat and how physics are, are maintained. You know, it, it's still science fiction, but at the same time, he's uh, he's just bending rules and not breaking them. <laughs> so you know, everything is mo- you know is maintains momentum, and you have to deal with large distances and really high velocities, and and how those get really strange in some instances. So, uh, it's just it's an excellent series of books. It's I believe there's seven books right now, maybe eight. Wow. But uh, it's really, really good. So, and it, he doesn't get bogged down in a lot of stuff. Like he knows why the reader is there. You know, the reader is there for <laughs> ship combat. He's not. They're not there for, you know, romances or s- intrigue subplots. You know, that there is kind of like who's the silent one? Rather quickly, and there's not a whole lot of twists and turns and he doesn't drag things out very long so highly recommend the book series cool I'll have to put that on my uh, uh, audible list yes definitely do but uh, speaking of books I enjoy yes, let's talk let's, about this book yeah let's talk about Tao dang that was another awesome segue we're good at this then you break the fourth wall. Okay, so let's let's talk first and foremost. If you have the old book, you do not need this book. You can buy the campaign book, which will give you all the new stuff in this, plus a series of uh, like campaign missions and a few formations for Space Marines because Space Marines got to be everywhere, you know. But if you do decide to break down and buy this book, I can easily say that this is the nicest and probably the best Tau book that they have ever produced. So we've got, I mean, the art in it is just absolutely beautiful from from cover to cover. They they have done just an incredible job on this. I mean, every page I turn, I'm just smiling because you know, everything they've done is so, so very nice. You know, some of it is new artwork. Some of it is not new artwork. You know, or they might have touched things up or colorized things. Uh, but it's all just very, very seamless. And, and you've got to love the way that they've done it. You know, they've added in, you know, some of these, uh, you know, like the color plates, which we're kind of used to with the Marines, but we're seeing here now. Do we so, have a second phase now? Nope. Nope, nope, nope. And that's the other thing that I like is, you know, they've expanded the army and what it does, and they've given the players a lot of what they want, but at the same time, they did it without changing the core of what the army does. That core being, we shoot a lot of stuff. A lot. Um... So let me start now. What most people are talking about, and what most people are concerned about, is uh, the hunter cadre and the hunter contingent. And those are the ones that give you the special rules that allow you to uh, help Overwatch. You know, uh, do your supporting fire from 12 inches instead of your normal six, and it also lets you uh, fire as if one unit. And there's a lot of controversy over that. How so? So, Okay, so let me read the exact line to you. It says, whenever a unit from a hunter contingent selects a target in the shooting phase, any number of other units from the same detachment who can still shoot can add their firepower to the attack. These units must shoot the same target, resolving their shots as if they were a single unit. This includes the use of marker light abilities. When three or more units combine their firepower, the firing models add plus one to their ballistic skill. Now, it's the key phrase that's getting everybody's getting stuck on is resolving their shots as if they were a single unit. Um, 
some people believe that because marker lights are mentioned, marker lights are the only way that you can impact this. Other people believe that if there's a special rule that says it affects the entire unit, like uh, Tau have a piece of war gear that allows them to reroll their misses for the entire unit if one model in the unit doesn't fire. Some people say that, well, now everyone is acting as a single unit. So that means that not only does this single unit that has the actual model in it get that special rule, but everybody who's firing at the same time gets that special rule as well. So war one piece of war gear transfers across the whole detachment? Potentially, or theoretically. And so there's a lot of argument going on right now about that. Now, I don't want to get into that because I think that there's there's good arguments to be made on both sides. So, but I don't want to talk about that. But it's there. You guys can look it up and find out more about that if you want to. But uh, what they call cadres, you know, are basically detachments or formations. And one of the reasons. And the other reason why I think this book is so great is because it's actually letting you run your your Tau Force the way that you've always wanted to. Uh, do you like stealth suits? Fine, you can just take stealth suits. Do you just like big fighting robots like your Riptides and your Crisis suits? Then just take Riptides and your Crisis suits. You're, they're really letting you do things the way that you would want to do it. And there's... You know, do you just want to take a bunch of drones? Guess what? You can just take a bunch of drones. Can you run crew? And you can. All you by can. Themselves? You can. Really? Yes. Now, this leads me to the second thing of they take they took the good units and they made them better, and they took the crappy units and they kept them crappy. <laughs> so so uh, we won't see you field the best bits? There are, there are three units that really suffer in this, and it's the Kroot and the Vespid and the Tau Flyer. Now let's just get this out of the way right now. And I'm going to say they suffer because they didn't actually make them any better. So it's not like they got worse or they got nerfed. Just for some reason, GW said, it's great. Don't even worry about them. We think that they're amazing units, so we won't change them one bit. When really these are the units that everybody's having problems with and nobody seems to want to take. Yeah, nobody, I don't ever see anybody fielding uh, the, the bomber. No, and this was the perfect time uh, you know, to give them some kind of advantage like through a formation. But really their formation doesn't help them at all. Which is kind of surprising. Dude. This seemed like a lost opportunity for GW to try and move some more of those kits. So, but yeah, all their formations, with the exception of the the Crute and Vespid one and the the air assets, are, are really really nice. Uh, I wouldn't call you foolish for taking any of these. Uh, the next thing that they did that was kind of cool is uh, the tower always talk about how they're always like advancing their uh, their doctrine on warfare and their weapons are always being upgraded and changing and adapting. And so in the previous codex, uh, we had a lot of uh, what we call signature systems for weapons, which are kind of like uh, relics for everyone okay. else. So those are the experimentals, right? Right, the experimentals. Well, several of the weapons that were experimental last time have now been upgraded to just regular weapons this time. <laughs> and so, so it's, it's so this kind of fun like the tower no blowing thing. up the yeah. the poor guy's head. <laughs> yeah, I would have loved to see like, you know, they say, well, it doesn't get hot anymore, but it's one less strength or something, you know, because we we figured this out. Or wasn't that in? Uh, it was in the I think the old book, right? They they were talking about that a piece of kit and all that, and it blew up a, a fire warrior's uh, brain inside his helmet. No, but they w they did talk about how they looked at a, like some of the Imperial weapons, like a plasma cannon that gets hot. And the Tau just said, well, we know how to fix that. You just like tone down the power a little bit. And guess what? It doesn't blow up on you. 
which is why Tau Plasma is strength six instead of the Imperial strength seven, but it doesn't get hot like the Imperials does. So yeah, that's kind of just like one little fun thing there. So you now have cyclic ion blasters and air bursting fragmentation projectors that you can you know, put into your army army wide now instead of just uh, you know a couple of suits for experimental purposes. Uh, but otherwise, your war gear is pretty much the same. Price to, because it's the same codex, the prices haven't changed. Uh, we have some new we have some new pictures here. You know the of the commander and the ethereal. Uh, the interesting thing is this is the ethereal that they're showing out of the starter or the the campaign box. So oh. it's made a lot of people wonder if maybe this will become a, a regular cell model at, at some point. Which I hope so because this is the first ethereal model that I actually like. <laughs> so I'm just flipping here through in the units, and there's not a lot to talk about. Um, your Fire Warrior teams kind of got split. There's now the Strike Team, which is the Fire Warrior team that... You know, Breachers already, you know, with their, uh, their very short-range AP3 guns. Uh, they can now take their tactical support turret, which is kind of cool because this was the one thing that I was really asking for, was for Fire Warriors to be able to take some sort of heavy weapon in their squads, and that turret performs the same function. Now, the interesting thing is, is you get to deploy it, and as long as you are within uh, two inches of it, and no enemies get within two inches of it, the target stays still. But if you move away from where that is, or somebody gets in close, the turret disappears. But the cool thing is, so let's say a bunch of orcs came up and charged this unit, and somehow this unit survived that charge. Well, that turret disappeared because the orcs got too close. But in their next uh, shooting phase, or end of their movement phase, the fire warriors get to put that turret back down again. Huh. So does it? It's kit, not uh, um, So it doesn't count towards the unit re resolution. It shouldn't. It doesn't actually have any kind of profile or wounds, and it can't ever actually be targeted either. Okay. So what does it do? Uh, it's basically, you can either put a smart missile system on it, which is a Assault 4, Strength 5, AP 5, 18-inch uh, missiles, or you can put a 36-inch, or a missile pod, which is 36-inch Strength 7, AP 4. So it's really just a way to put a heavy weapon unit into the squad. So, and I love that. Uh, so crisis suits. Uh, we do get to kit, I think. I, I just wish that I didn't already have a whole bunch of crisis suits. They've done two things different to crisis suits, and nobody's been talking about it, which I, but I think that this is one of the biggest changes to the army. Is one, you can now take crisis suits in squads of eight, versus in the past it's always been three. So, and this is big because, I mean, one, crisis suits are incredibly powerful and they're glass cannons, but now you can you know, lay down even more hurt with them if you so choose. And the second, this is actually GW's way of addressing what people have been asking for. For a long time, Tau players have wanted to take their crisis suits as troops. Not because crisis suits as troops are amazing, but because they really love crisis suits and they have a bunch of them and they want to field all of those. So it doesn't let you take just a crisis suit army unless you decide to take the formation. Also, then they won't be ob objective secure. Correct. But if you want to run, you can run 24 suits in your game if you want to. I, I don't know anybody who actually has 24 suits, but you can run almost as many crisis suits in your army as you want to and still keep a combined arms attachment. The other big thing that they've changed to it is crisis suits can now take your signature systems, and you can take up to three. 
Well, your leader can. So one of the things that people always had trouble with before was what they called a buff manager, which was a commander that took those a few pieces of war gear that allowed the squad to uh, re-roll their hits, or re-roll their misses, and as long as uh, they didn't move, right? As long as they didn't shoot. So it would let the whole squad ignore cover and re-roll their misses. But you had to take that on a commander because he was the only one allowed to take the signature systems. But now, with the way they've changed the rules, any cri any old crisis suit can do that. So you're not limiting your commander with the role that he has to take, which is good because I always disagreed with using your commander like that. So uh, you have crisis suit bodyguards, which work pretty much the same way, except they are not limited in the number of uh, signature systems. So you have your ghost keto, which again is new. Uh, the Riptide, thankfully its stat line hasn't changed, but as we discussed before, you can take it in units of three. So again, if you really love Riptides, and there's not a lot of reason not to, you can run a lot of them. You want to take could, nine in your squad? You could squadron. You could take a squad three, and if you wanted to, in a combined arms attachment, you could run nine of these guys. Yeah. I, I don't want to imagine the amount of how high of a points game you're playing. Because honestly, you're paying about 200 points per. And that's a lot of guys. That's a lot, that's of, a lot of points. It's a lot of wounds. Yeah, you know, I mean, they're, they're five wounds. Toughness six, five wounds a pop. Two plus armor save. So let's see, uh, a couple more interesting things here. Yeah, we've got the, the Sun Shark and the Razor Shark. They haven't changed, even though they really should have. <laughs> um, it's kind of interesting. You can tell, you know, what are the old pictures versus what are the new pictures, uh, you know, between the, the old brown paint job and the new white one. And I think this new white paint job looks pretty slick. Yeah, it's a... Uh... Kind of like a white scars kind of look to it. So, I guess the last thing I kind of wanted to say was, uh, oh, you get tactical objectives for them now, which is kind of cool. So, uh, they're pretty towel like here. Let me, I'll, I'll just kind of read through them here real quick. So we have six of them. First one is score one victory point at the end of your turn if at least one enemy unit that made a successful charge in the enemy's last turn is completely destroyed. So, uh, not bad. Score one victory point at the end of your turn if one or more enemy units were completely destroyed by a unit from your army that is in your deployment zone. Tash should have no problem with that one. Score one victory point at the end of turn if an enemy unit was completely destroyed and or failed a morale check during your turn. Uh, if three, you get D3 victory points. Score one victory point at the end of your turn. Now, this is an interesting one. If there's at least one enemy unit completely within 12 inches of one table edge, and at least one enemy unit completely within 12 inches of the opposite table edge. So you're. this is one of the few times where I've seen uh, an objective where you're not holding an objective or you're not trying to kill someone you're actually in this one you're actually trying to lure your opponent to different areas of the board and i just thought that was kind of neat so score one victory point at the end of your turn if at least one enemy unit that started your turn within nine inches of one of your units and not in its own deployment zone is completely destroyed so you can see a lot of these are just destroying units which is Kind of what the Tau do really well. And then score D3 victory points at the end of your turn if you control an objective marker that was controlled by the enemy at the start of the turn. Score D3 plus three victory points if you capture three such objective markers. Score one extra victory point if no friendly models were destroyed during the turn. So 
Yeah. So those are pretty cool. Yeah. Those won't help you in like LVO, right? No, they will definitely not help you like in LVO or most tournament games. But uh, it's kind of neat because these feel really fluffy, like as to what Tau do. So there's, it's not a whole lot of taking ground. It's a whole lot of eliminating units or moving your, you know, forcing your opponents to move in a certain way. So then, uh, again here, just a picture I really like that I think is cool. That I said the art that they've got in this book is is really really great. I mean, these books are always good for their pictures, but this time around, I think that they've outdone themselves. Um, but yeah, reading through the fluff, the last thing that I kind of noticed was it feels. And another reason why I think this is great is the Tau always kind of felt a little different from everybody else in the grim darkness, right? You know, they weren't the the bright, shining beacons. But now they've, and they still are. You know, if there's one good guy in 40k, it's the Tau. But I think what they've done, they've started emphasizing the Ethereal's control over everyone and how maybe they're actually a subjugated race. And so it's fun. They, they started in introducing a few more. So that's it. I love this new codex, uh, mostly because it doesn't change your army. You know, what you were running before, you can keep running now. Uh, it's just taking all the stuff that you've loved and has made it better. Cool. So now we're just going to have to have you break down, buy some new kits, and then have a test game. We'll see. So, all right, that's all I've got for tonight, Alan, and I think my voice is starting to give out a bit. <laughs> too much towel for you? Mm, too, much, too much squealing with fanboy joy. <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, I think that's it for the show tonight, folks. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, let us know, are you interested in Drop Fleet Commander? Have you pledged? Are you looking to pledge? What race are you looking to buy? Are you going to be getting to, into Tau? Are you like Casey? Are you in love with uh, the goat fishman in space? Uh, let us know what you think of the uh, Codex. Um like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe to see more, and Casey, anything else? No, just that, as usual, if there's a product you'd like us to take a look at, or there's a topic you'd like us to discuss, just shoot us at an email at theatomicsalt at gmail.com. This is The Atomic Salt, and Kickstarter has just blown Hawk's mind. <laughs> Good night, folks. We'll see you next week.